So today's class is about perennials. Um, does everybody know the difference between a perennial and an annual? Um, so those that don't, um, just real quick, um, a perennial is something that's going to come up year after year after year. Um, an annual is something that you actually have to plant annually. That's how I remember it. Um, or P is for permanent, <coughs> perennial. Um, so there, however it works for you, it's easier for me to say annual, I'm planting annually. Um, like this pentas here, um, this is an annual. Um, annuals are great um, because they add that pop of instant color for you. Um, so they're a great place in the yard for you. Um, they do well in pots. Um, they can also help you fill a pot if you have some perennials in the back and you've got a really large pot and you, you're waiting for those perennials to grow. Um, they'll, they, they, they kind of fill that space until the, the year when they really take off and get big for you. Um, there are different seasons for perennials, so um, when you're planting your perennial beds, you want to kind of think about that. Um, you don't want everything that's blooming all at the same time, so you want to remember there are spring blooming perennials, there are summer blooming perennials, and then there are summer and fall blooming perennials. Um, some of your spring blooming perennials are like your columbine, your peonies, uh, your iris, one thing that I wanted to mention, uh, Michelle told us about annuals and perennials, and most of us know about that. But one thing you should know is that uh, not all perennials are created equal, so to speak. I mean, we have perennials that are evergreen, and we have some out here, uh, the Petoni Aster and uh, Fraser's Red Tip Fotinias. So some, uh, not only are they perennials, but they stay, they keep their leaves all winter long. Then we have some perennials that are deciduous, so they lose their leaves, but you still see some sticks out there. You, it's easy to kind of prune them back in the winter time. It reminds you that it is winter and not too much is going on. And then there are also perennials that are known as herbaceous plants, and they're, they're not really woody at all. They're kind of soft tissue, and so they can just kind of disappear. And when it gets really cold, they may even look like, uh, you know, sautéed onions in your pan. <laughs> the thing to be aware of with these plants is that it's really easy to lose track of where you planted them. So you may forget over the winter time, and then come spring, all of a sudden these little shoots come up, and you don't know whether that's a weed or your <laughs> desirable plant. And your gardener may not know either, might just knock them all down or spray them all. And so it often is recommended that you mark these herbaceous plants. And I mean, you can mark however you want anyway, but so that you know where these are. Maybe if it's in a pot, it's not such an issue. But out in the middle of the yard, that could be an issue. Obviously not an issue with the evergreens. But so those are the types of, uh, three types of perennials. Yes, ma'am. I find it's easiest to take a picture of the garden when it's in bloom. So Good then idea. I sort of know the spacing of where these perennials are. Right. Everybody hear that? That's a photograph of summertime uh, blooming uh, is. Uh, can't hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Is that any better? Oh, okay. much better. <laughs> much better. Okay. <laughs> right. So, whatever it is, you know, a photograph. Uh, little stakes or signs, just like um, this is a recent experience for me. I have a lot of iris in my yard, and uh, I got a call from a friend in the iris society who said, We go around and we help you dig up your iris because, as you know, they need to be divided every several years so that they can continue blooming. And you have them all marked and identified which color and the name and everything. <laughs> I said, Are you kidding? I mean, this. These have been in the ground for five years. And you know, they grow all over the place. The leaf that you might have marked, the leaf has gone away. And so uh, I said, but look, I had this picture from about five years ago. I think that sold them. I said there were some beautiful gold and purple ones. And so these folks came out and they dug up all my irises, which to me is like a backbreaking job. Fortunately, it had been after a rain. And so the soil was pretty soft and it was not it was too difficult the job. I helped out a little bit. I cleaned them all up. Uh, I don't know, we're, we're not planning to make this a class into iris, but if you have iris, you probably know that every several years, 
you need to pull them out of the ground, divide them, cut them back, uh, amend the soil a bit, and then put them back in. And then after you put them all back in, be aware that you're probably going to need a new bed somewhere else because there's always more. Even, even if you throw away dead ones, there's always more iris. And so then you can expand off to another bed. But um, this is also a perennial and pretty hardy plant. I think the only thing that will ever really damage this is if you have a flood and the, bulb, the bulbs sit underwater for a while. Otherwise, uh, they'll survive almost anything. I've had them survive you know, heat and dogs wrestling on top of it and anything you can imagine. So I think what we're going to do is just kind of go through some of the perennials that we have. Um, we do have a sale on perennials this week, um, and I believe it's through the 31st as well. Um, you buy three, you get one free. Oh, just today. Sorry. <laughs> I misspoke. Um, so to get started, um, this is an evening primrose. Um, um, one thing we should talk, talk about is when you're planning your perennial beds, kind of do some research. Um, this is a very, in, it's beautiful, but it's a very invasive perennial. So you don't want to put it in a really prominent place where you've got some other really pretty things because it's, it's going to take over that spot. So um, one thing I would suggest is kind of think about what you want to plant. Um, and know how that perennial is going to behave. Um, like I said, this one, I've seen patches that are five foot long uh, or five foot wide with this stuff. Um, really pretty, blooms all summer long, so it's a really nice perennial to have. Um, some of them, you can see them that are white. Um, if you see them that are white, they need some food. Um, Sulfur helps bring that color back into it. Um, that being said, you know, if you have anything like your um, hydrangeas, um, azaleas, even your autumn blaze maples, anything that really does a color, sulfur um, will help bring that color out. As a matter of fact, Michelle, I had uh, started out with one plant of Mexican primrose and it spread out really nicely. It was beautiful. And then the next spring, it migrated across the driveway. So there were no there was no soil there on the driveway, but it managed to move over there and into the neighbor's yard. They weren't very happy about that, they didn't really like that plant. So you have to that's something to be aware of. And one of the things we talk about in general about your uh, about your perennial bed is think in terms of seasonality and uh, and the hope is that you can have continuous color all summer long. For example, here in, I think around early March, we had forsythias, and they were flowering all over the place, beautiful yellow flowers. Well, those are all done now. But as the season moves along, all plants have their own schedule and their own cycle. We have plants, for example, uh, crepe myrtle and lantana are very late bloomers. They really won't get going until almost July. So if you've got spring plants in the garden that precede that, you get those to flower. And then when they're, when they're done, um, yeah, and even the hibiscus is a, is a late bloomer. So that's something to be aware of, as well as, you know, the growing habits, the mature size, and then its flowering schedule. So that you always have something going on in the yard, and it isn't just, you know, this massive bloom in the springtime and then just green all, all summer long. Um, so this guy is a hardy hibiscus. Um, you need a little bit of afternoon shade for this plant. Um, typically, it, it'll get about three, maybe four foot tall. Um, it's more of a shrub. Um, but this is one that people will come to me in the end of May and say, my plant died, I don't see it. Well, usually first of June, you'll start seeing new growth out of it. Um, so this is kind of one of those late, um, sprouters is that a technical term um, it comes up later in the, in the year and then it starts blooming mid-july early august that's a hardy hibiscus it's a hardy hibiscus um, this one's lunar red um, the the flowers are bigger than a saucer um, really pretty they only they're like a tropical hibiscus they only bloom for the one day and then they go away and then you'll have a new bloom 
about three or four foot as well, tall and wide. Um, this is a um, day lily. Um, this is another one that periodically needs divided. Um, they're coming out with new lilies now. You know, you used to have just the kind of spring, early summer bloomers um, with these. Now they have um, lilies that bloom a lot of the summer, all, all summer long. Um, this one is the the everyday lily cream. Um, what they did was there's another one called Stella Dioro, um, and it's a smaller lily that is it blooms all summer long. So they're they're great plants that they're good for neutralizing, um, but something that gives you flower all the time. Um, you do um, separate these and divide them in the fall. And in the course of the season, you can also deadhead them. You know, we talk about deadheading roses and everybody's familiar with that, but really a lot of plants can benefit from deadheading. You just cut away the spent blossoms and you encourage a new growth. And a lot of times you can extend the life of the day lilies as well as other plants. And uh, we do that here as a regular practice. We just cut back all the flowers and, and just keep the plants looking good. And it's just, uh, you know, it's not just put them in the ground and wait till next season. You, you do need to pay attention to them. Some folks say, you know, I go out there on the front porch in the morning, I cup of coffee, I did head my roses, and it's kind of a nice way to start my day. And then it doesn't become an overwhelming job where you've got to reach in and there's 10, you know, spent blossoms and you're already heading towards uh, rose hips and all that kind of stuff. So you can just kind of work on it on an ongoing basis. This is one of my favorite plants, um, especially for this area. Um, this is an autumn sage. Um, it's a fairly large perennial. Um, it all can also, I guess, could be considered shrub or you know small shrub. Um, but the hummingbirds just love this guy. Um, blooms from spring till fall. So if, if you need something that pops, um, that just continuously blooms and, and there's very little maintenance. Um, every once in a while you can go through and get out the woody stuff, um, but this is one, definitely one to have in your garden. You yes, said it wasn't a sage, so what is it? I said it, it, it's either a, a perennial or sh a small shrub. It's an autumn sage. Um, this one actually has a couple of different names. It's also a salvia, salvia gregii is the, the Latin term for it. Um, it's an autumn sage. Um, the other nice thing about this guy is it, it's animal resistant. Um, it does have that sagey smell. Does that one also come in a purple? She asked if this one comes in a purple. This one actually comes in like five or six colors. Um, ignition purple is another variety that we have. It's a bright purple, really pretty. I don't have any right now. Um, Hot lips is a red and white. Um, sparkle, heat wave sparkle is a pink one. Is it um, full sun? All full sun. And one of the things that's uh, nice about autumn sage, Michelle mentioned hummingbirds just love to come in. <laughs> And we have tables where there are a bunch of plants on the table, and we're, we'll be talking to people and say, you know, the hummingbird just love this. And right then, the hummingbird comes in on cue. And they always want to know, are they trained? And they do like, do we pay them? And we say, of course, we have extra nectar over here for them. And so that's why they come in, they see a group of people, it's time to come hovering in. How big? About three feet wide by maybe two and a half feet tall. Yes, you can. She's asking a little bit about the maintenance, and I can address that because I've got one of these. And what I do every winter, because it is deciduous and there's thin stems left, is I just kind of go over it with an electric hedge clipper. But you can do a hand clipper as well. I just kind of shape it to a smaller mound. I, that helps to keep it from getting too woody or leggy. Once they get woody, then they kind of separate and they're not as attractive. I prefer something that has kind of a natural hedge type shape, not a, you know, necessarily a, a rectangle or anything like that, but a nice mound. And so that's about all the maintenance you really need to do on the autumn sage. And they are different sizes. Um, the ignition purple that she mentioned is one of the smaller ones. I, uh, I think it tops out two by two. Um, we're out in Williamson Valley and it's pretty sandy and rocky. 
geography where we are, how do they do with that? Okay, so the question is about soil, where this woman lives, sandy soil. Uh, you're actually lucky you, you, you have soil. Uh, it's it's going to do well, but what we recommend for any planting is that you use a mulch to amend the soil. I think it's right here behind me. So we have a product that's known as a premium mulch. And when you're planting, you want to plant a hole that's just the depth of the root ball, but about two or three feet wide, two or three times as wide as the pot. And then you can amend the soil with mulch and your native soil or sand or clay or whatever you have. It's a mixture of maybe one part mulch, the two parts, whatever kind of soil you have. You know, you know, yeah. rocks, yeah. throw out rocks, throw rocks. yeah, get rid of rocks. Any rock that's larger than a golf ball, get rid of it. And um, and they will do well. I mean, it is, uh, it's a pretty hardy plant. And as long as it's got full sun and hummingbirds, I think it's going to be happy. Um, so this one's a moonshine yarrow. Um, this one is a, a pretty drought tolerant, along with the autumn sage, is also drought tolerant. Um, nice color, um, pretty silver foliage. Um, this one's a repeat bloomer if you keep it deadheaded. Um, a nice good plant. Um, usually two and a half, three foot, um, especially with the flower stalks. And one of the things about yarrow, uh, we'll get you in just a moment, one of the things about yarrow, it is uh, a animal resistant plant right and usually it is but you know this year you know we have these lists of these plants are good the Hadley won't eat these and the deer won't eat these this year all bets are off uh, I just you know because of the drought and the other conditions I planted one of these beautiful yarrows and in about two nights a bunny ate it I saw it out there and I tried to chase it away it was gone by the time I arrived and so was most of the plant Normally, I don't think that happens. I'm hoping with this weather, there'll be more greenery for the animals to eat. But I looked out there, and there was this, I mean, big, fat bunny. And, you know, it was gaining weight on what I was trying to grow in my yard. And we have a lot of coyotes in my neighborhood. I'm thinking, where is a coyote when you need one? I mean, this, yeah, this would have been a great meal for the whole family, probably. Shasta daisies, um, nice, really pretty plant, um, goes well with other plants, um, needs a little bit of companionship. Um, it doesn't like to be out by itself um, all alone. Um, it, it'll tend to dry out a little bit. Um, so if you mix it with some others, it, it gets a little protection from the wind and the hot sun. Um, so make sure you, if you're going to put this in the sun or put it in a partial shady spot. Um, Coneflower is the other one that is just one of my favorites. Um, these come in so many different colors nowadays, it, it's incredible. It used to be just purple. Um, now there's reds, um, which is this, this one's called uh, Salsa Red. Um, there's one called Cheyenne Spirit that has uh, pinks and yellows, um, and it actually changes colors um, during its uh, blooming time. Um, this is one that if you keep deadheading, it's going to bloom from midsummer to fall for you. Um, when it gets closer to fall, you want to kind of leave those seed heads there. The birds love them, especially those little golden finches that we have here. Um, nice food, great picture op opportunities. And Excuse one me. of the things about the Shasta daisies is that they do spread very nicely. They'll fill in in an area. And I used to grow a bunch of these and I'd have real tall spikes and big white flowers. But in the winter I would cut them back. And as I was cutting them back with the clippers, I would see these seeds just broadcasting everywhere. So I could tell it was continuing to fill in. So it's something that you know, give it a little space and allow it to grow and it'll become a nice perennial plant, come back every summer. Yes, ma'am. Didn't open, okay. So her Shasta daisies didn't flower this summer. Uh, if you, it's hard to say what it might be. If you have a cutting that you could bring in, we have a microscope here where we can uh, look for bugs or fungus or whatever might be going on that projects onto a screen. Could be something that's eating the buds um, 
you know, before they can flower. I had a problem like that, I think, with my uh, geraniums. It seemed like the buds were ready to go, and there's some little holes in there, and then it's empty. So who knows? Anything can happen. Uh, but, you know, we could we can try and diagnose if you, if you bring something in. It also in. could be the heat, um, kind of like the tomatoes that drop the blossoms. Um, sometimes the higher temperatures can cause perennials to do that, too. Yes, ma'am. Do the flowers do well in partial shade? Um, they need at least six hours, so if they can get that, um, they tend to get leggy um, if they, they don't have enough. So that question was, do our coneflowers going to do okay in partial shade? And Michelle's answer was that we're going to need about six hours of uh, sunlight for that. But so you said the chefs is like company, any company, or, or each other's <laughs> so, so when you're when you're thinking of planting stuff, um, a couple of things to keep in mind is you want to make sure that they all have your your water, you know, all have the same watering needs, um, all the same sun needs. Um, so, yeah, if you want to put a whole bunch of staff daisies together, that would be okay. If you wanted to mix them with other plants, just make sure the watering requirements are, are the same. Right, because you mentioned they like company. So yeah, just, so yeah, a couple of different plants, if you wanted to put, yeah, if you want to put comb flowers, um, they're not, you don't have to segregate them. <laughs> okay. and, there, and there are different kinds of Shasta daisies. We have some yellow ones here earlier this year. And I remember in this garden where I grew them in the past, I found some little short ones. So I put those in between the large ones. So there was kind of a height variety and it lends a little bit of variety to the, to the landscape. Um, so that being said, um, you know, when you're planting your perennial garden, you want to think about your heights too. You know, you don't want to put a something that's really tall in front of something that's going to be shorter. So kind of keep their heights in mind and you know, put the taller stuff in the back. The, yes, ma'am. The Shasta daisy can it be companioned with other Shasta daisy plants, or does it need to be yes. something yeah. different? Yes. Okay. So Shasta daisies can grow together with okay. different varieties that'll be fine you could have as i mentioned short and tall white and yellow ones you know just give them a little room because they're going to want to spread out a bit so what Doug, i have i have a question from the live stream okay somebody's asking will these plants that you're describing work well in raised beds um the plants will work really well in raised beds um because they don't have to deal with the decomposed granite, um, the caliche, all that stuff that we fight every day when we plant something. So raised beds are ideal for, for, for perennials. And another reason for that, Ken, and to the listener, is that it's a little bit easier to control the soil in a raised bed and to control the pH, you know, how our soils here tend to be very high in alkaline scale. And so for certain plants, hydrangeas and azaleas and acid loving plants uh, even berries it's kind of a struggle in the, our regular crummy soil but in a bed you can put in potting soil uh, topsoil and you can mix in some of the products that we have over here to help raise the acidity of the soil and the raised bed is an easier environment to uh, keep that going okay so this guy here is another sage. Um, this is meadow sage. Um, uh, this one blooms spring through fall, um, but it, it, this one does require a little bit of maintenance. So when the blossoms are spent like this, um, you're, you're just gonna come in and deadhead it. Um, these guys come in purples and pinks um, and then the whites. So they're a nice plant, um, lower growing as far as your, your foliage and stuff. Um, some of their fl uh, flowers kind of come up. So this is one that would, you would put in the front. Um, but it, it, it's a sage, so it's animal resistant. Um, so it's a nice companion plant for your, your perennial bed. Coreopsis um, are um, another great perennial to have. Um, these are another variety that has so many different 
um, colors and sizes. Um, like I said, these are both Coreopsis, but they don't look anything alike. Um, huh? That looks like Marigold. <laughs> it does. Um, this is a Golden Sphere um, Coreopsis, and this is a um, Tixie? Tixie, correct. Yeah. Um, so this has the narrow, more narrow leaves on it. A um, little bit taller. Um, I will say one thing about the Coreopsis is they are prone to pow powdery mildew, um, kind of like the, the garden flocks. Those are another one that tend to get powdery mildew, so kind of keep an eye on it. Um, if you're fertilizing pretty regularly, that tends to slow that down because our, our fertilizer has sulfur in it, and, and it's kind of a natural uh, fungus prohibitor. Yeah. Okay, so notice I'm keeping this at arm's length. This is a pompous grass. It has very sharp edges. So if you're out there working on it, pruning, pruning, be sure you wear um, gloves and long sleeves. However, this is a really good example of seasonality in, in, the, in your bed because most of the season, this is what you get. You have this kind of grassy looking plant. But in September, it sends out these shoots that are sometimes six, seven feet tall with little silky fronds at the top. And so when a lot of things in your yard, in your perennial bed maybe, are kind of slowing down, this is just taking off. And so it's just really nice uh, to have that at that time of year. Well, we have some all the way at the end of the parking lot out by the gates. And when they are blooming in September, they're beautiful. And, People come in here and they want to buy them. We can't keep them in we stock. We can't keep them in stock. You know, they just grab all of them. Um, fairly uh, uh, easy to maintain. It's just pruning and cut back those fronds. Some people like to keep them as dry flowers, but they're, they're kind of silky and they'll they'll spread around your yard a bit. But uh, it's definitely uh, really a beautiful kind of classic look. Just beware; they're not too crazy about being pruned. They'll they'll let you know about that. So, what else? Um, since we started with the ivory feathers here, um, grasses are one of those that are um, really great if you don't like a lot of maintenance. Um, they give you a lot of different colors, textures. Um, the pampas grass is really a, a taller one, so five to six foot tall and wide, and then it sends its feathers up um, that are even taller. Um, the Carl Forster is a feathery grass, um, gets about three foot wide, but it, it's more upright. So when its feathers come up, um, it's gonna top out about this tall. Um, really pretty. Um, like I said, they're very low maintenance. All you have to do is cut them back in the spring and that's done. That's it. Um, this is a red fox, fox red curly sage. Um, really pretty adds some uh, dramatic color to your yard um, again very low maintenance just water it once in a while um, feed it regularly because you have to feed here um, anybody that's new there is absolutely no nutrients ready uh, nutrients in this soil um, because of our pH plants can't intake it so that's why feeding is necessary three or four times a year um, water's all-purpose. It's a granular product. It's a 744. Um, so the numbers are, are, we try to keep the numbers low so it doesn't burn. Um, it's pet and, and kid safe. Um, it's a granular so it's really easy to apply. Um, we tell everybody to remember your holidays, Easter, Fourth of July, Halloween. Um, for evergreens and grasses, you want to hit them uh, in January as well. Easter, Fourth of July, Halloween, Halloween, and New Year's. And the way I feed in my garden is I get a 20 pound bag and I put it in a bucket. And all these instructions here about how many cups per thickness of the trunk. And of course, if you, if you want to be that precise, 
go ahead and do that. I don't feel like doing math in the garage before I head out to work. So I just have the bucket and it's just sort of a handful. If it's a big tree, it'll get three or four handfuls. If it's a good shrub, maybe two or three. But even flowers, herbs, vegetables, everything can benefit from this. And so what I did is I did the whole yard, about 20 pounds of fertilizer, just did a light sprinkling so it wasn't going to blow away because a storm was coming in. And lo and behold, it rained for about three hours. A nice light rain, not the usual monsoon, wash everything away. So I think that the plants have definitely benefited from that. It's about three weeks since I did that. And they, uh, they're kind of recovering from the June swoon, you might call it, the heat and the plants swooning because it's so hot and dry and lack of moisture. Um, and with the grasses, there are all different sizes, so you know you you can play with them that way as well. Um, this is little uh, red little bunny grass, um, so this one's going to stay small. Um, its little flowers are little; they look like little bunny tails, where which it gets its name. But this is a really pretty grass as well. Talk about that um, this is another feather reed grass. Um, for those that want a little bit different color, um, the variegated leaves on this one is really pretty. Um, it has the white and the green in it. Um, it's going to look very similar to this one. It has the more upright plumes. Um, it's not one of those floppy grasses. It, it's going to go straight up. Um, and then lastly, um, this is another colored grass. This is blue oak grass. Um, another moundy grass. This one will actually stay this color all winter, so it, it's more of an evergreen here. Blue oak grass. Uh huh. Um, possibly, but it's all of these grasses are more moundy. They're they're not like a long. You know, they're not going to spread like that. So we have been talking mostly about plants that are going to thrive in the sun in your yard. And of course, some of us might actually have a little bit of shade in our yard. And if you do, they have some You're lucky. Yeah, you're lucky. <laughs> and I want to show you a couple of my favorites. Um, this is called the uh, Bukura, the coral bells. And uh, if I had Look some, at that color. If I had some shade in my yard, I would love to put a combination of these in here. Um, they just have these little mounds, they don't get too big. You see these flowers and the one that Michelle's holding, they shoot up to maybe a foot tall. Very easy to cut back when they're done. Again, deadheading is advised. And these are shade-loving plants. They are perennials and they're, are they evergreen also? Um, no, these guys will, dip. They, they will die back. Um, like I said, the, the flowers aren't very spectacular, but you can't beat that leaf color. I mean, hookera or corbels. Um, um, the only thing that'll eat, well, they're not bunny resistant, um, so if you have bunnies, they're, they're probably might not be your right choice unless you're <laughs> caged in or fenced in or something. Um, the only insects that I've seen it, are, are the snails. If you keep that, you know, area of moist, um, snails tend to munch. Um, the last, the other shade plant that's on the end there. Um, and this is the first time I've ever seen this, this hosta, um, but it's gorgeous. Um, this is a cherry berry uh, hosta, plantain lily. Um, it's got the red stems. Um, even the leaves have the red stems. Uh, another shade plant. Um, this is another one that you kind of have to watch the, the, the snails on. If you start seeing holes in your leaves, you've got snails. Um, and there's all sorts of different remedies to get rid of those. Um, yeah, eventually you'll divide them because they, they can get really big. Um, so just take a pitchfork in the fall um, and lift them out, separate them that way. Could that one go, grow inside the hostas? The hostas won't grow inside, they need that light. Um, I brought this up. Um, because we do have some perennial milkweed. Um, this is a tropical milkweed. Um, milkweeds are always great for your gardens. Um, they invite the, the monarch butterflies, which are really important to our, our um, ec ec yeah, ec ec ecology system. 
Um, but um, basically the, the monarchs will lay their eggs on here. They'll eat it, so they'll devour the plant, um, and then they fly off and, and become um, butterflies. Um, um, these guys can take full sun. Um, they, uh, like I said, I do have perennial ones um, that come back year after year. Your tropicals are going to die. Um, they can't take our cold. Uh, but they're they're great. Like there's a great place for them in your garden. And if you're interested in uh, more detailed information about milkweed, come in on Sundays. Our cashier Patty is an expert and has, has grows all kinds of milkweeds and just loves to talk about them. So she has more information than I think the rest of us combined on milkweed. Yeah, Patty actually um, she tags them. Um, she, she'll collect the chrysalis um, and watch them come out as a butterfly um, and then she'll tag them and, and they track them um, to and from South America. So I would say if you have time, Patty's a great resource for butterflies if you want to learn more. We're trying to talk her into doing a class, but she won't do it yet. <laughs> um, last shade plant I brought up is, this is silver sunproof um, lily turf. Um, it's kind of like a mondo grass. Um, they do shoot out really purple, little purple flowers, um, but this is another shade loving perennial. Uh, Mondo grass. Um, it, lily turf is the, the real the official name for it. Um, so we've kind of gone through all the perennials. Um, oh, my crepe myrtle. Um, this is a shrub. Um, but it's one of the prettiest things on the property right now. Um, this is very unique this year. Um, I've never seen one with purple leaves like this. Um, so it's very, very striking in, in your yard. So if you need, everything is green and you need some purple, um, this is a great plant to grab. Um, Size-wise, it, it, it's one of the larger shrubs. It gets about six to eight feet tall. Um, Probably a little bit wider, four, four foot, four foot wide. I can't talk today. Um, pretty pink flowers. There's another one that we have that actually have orange, but we haven't seen it pop yet. So uh, we're excited about seeing that one come out. Um, full sun. Full sun. Full sun. And again, one of the things about crepe myrtle is that it, it comes out late in the season. So it may be the end of June after a fair amount of hot weather that's going to come out. I have a couple of these in my yard, not this one, I have a pink dwarf, but it's about this height. And one day, it just had lots of buds, and then it rained, and the conditions were right, and almost overnight, it just had this mass of flowers, and just really beautiful, and we'll keep doing that all summer. So that's another great addition for your, for your perennial bed, just be aware that it's going to be later in the season before you really see the flowers. Yeah, you can trim them down. Um, the nice thing about crepe myrtles is they do come in all a variety of different sizes. We have dwarf ones that stay about two foot. Um, there are some in that three to four foot. Um, this one's in that six to eight. There are some that are more, I'd say, small tree form. Um, a lot of them are multi-stemmed, um, which is a neat concept. If you trim it up, you'll have that the limbs to for winter interest if you need to. Um, really pretty. Um, so they stay green in the garden? Uh, no, these guys will lose their leaves, they're deciduous. Fairly easy to prune. Again, the, I use the electronic catch clipper just kind of once or twice over, shape it so it doesn't get too, too wild and leggy. We had a woman who worked here and she moved to uh, back east somewhere and uh, she sent me an email. She would stopped somewhere for uh, gas in Arkansas and she saw a crepe myrtle that was about the size of a house. So they won't get that big here. But I, I, and I've never seen one that big, but it sure would be uh, interesting. But they definitely, in different parts of the country, they, they get to be quite, quite large. Yes, ma'am. Are they at the edge of our, uh, our temperature range here? No, um, a lot of them, all of the new ones are coming out. They're zone six. So, so they'll, they'll tolerate our cold.
some of the other ones weren't, huh? Um, there are some that are zone seven and eight, so kind of look at the tags. Um, when you guys come in, um, we're very seasonal as far as what we have out at the time. Um, people don't buy, buy stuff if they're not blooming. So if you're looking for your spring stuff, come in in the spring. Um, you know, your columbines, your delphiniums, poppies, uh, uh, peonies, all in the springtime. Um, after May, you won't see them. Um, huh? You say peonies. Peonies. Tomato, tomato. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, the um, cone flowers, I mean, obviously, we're right in the middle of summer. The stuff that's blooming now, um, a lot of it will bloom into the fall. So your cone flowers, your black-eyed Susans, uh, rutabecchias, glardias, those are all summer blooming, fall, into the fall. So the season that you want when you're planting your garden, remember, you want stuff blooming all the time, you know, so you don't just have one season, everything else is green. Um, so keep that in mind as well. Also the question, pardon me, there was a question about cold hardiness. When you look on the tags, uh, most of the tags for our perennials are going to be, have plenty of cold hardiness for our climate. And they'll probably say zones six to seven, cold hardiness down to uh, zero minus 10. So we, every, most of the plants up here are the annuals. We didn't talk about that. So they're obviously, their annuals are not going to make it through the winter, but almost everything else is perennial and is more than adequately cold hardy for our climate. I figure if it gets below minus 10 here, we're living in the wrong place, right? <laughs> we can move back to California, right? but, but that's something you don't have to worry about. But that's a way to learn. When you look at these, especially the Monrovia tags, we'll talk about the zones, the size, uh, the sun requirements, water requirements, and that's something that you can always look at when you're here to help you decide if it's the right plant for your for your yard. And we do sell zone eight perennials, um, and, and that doesn't mean they're not going to come back. You just have to find that right spot for them because there's a lot of microclimates in your yard. Um, if you have a place that has radiant heat um, right next to a wall or something like that, um, mulch will keep that heat in. Um, and it depends on the year, you know. Um, it, it's fun to experiment, you know, and, and see different things and how they grow. Yes. Um, so in every perennial garden, there are pests and diseases. Um, so keep an eye out. Um, sometimes if you don't pay attention, overnight, Two days, you can miss out on a whole slew of grasshoppers coming through, or you know, and you can go out and ah, it's gone. Um, so, kind of pay attention to your yard. Um, Arizona is not an easy place to garden. It, we do have our challenges, but it's doable. I mean, it's if you pay attention, you can succeed. Um, Insects, multi-purpose insect spray will get rid of a hundred or more different pests. Um, this is a contact killer, um, aphids, mealybugs, um, spider, spider mites. mites. Um, it, it'll, it'll take care of them all. Um, it leaves a residue on the plant, so whether they're there or if they eat it after you've sprayed, there's residue on there that'll uh, kill them that way. Um, Follow the directions. Um, this is actually a synthetic crushed chrysanthemum um, mixture. So it, it's safe, you can use it on your vegetables. Um, I think it says on your tomatoes, use up to one day before harvest. So just kind of keep an eye on it. Read your directions, it's very important. Um, there aside, just a really quick mention, there's a lot of caterpillars and worms out there um, these days. This is a great one for your your worms, cat, uh, caterpillars, and that type of thing. Um, if you have the tomato hornworm on your tomatoes, this is a great thing to get rid of those. And some some plants, some shrubs, like it can get a, say a powdery mildew uh, or other similar problems. This is a copper fungicide. You can spray on that. It's very effective in taking care of it. All of these products are 
uh, concentrates. So that ideally, you have a you can hook up to a hose sprayer, and you know you just spray whatever plants you needed. Some of these come in a little spritzer, ready to use type container as well. And with uh, the copper fungicide. Some of the things that I had mentioned that tend to get the powdery mildew, um, it's just like my cucumbers at home. I know they're prone to powdery mildew. Um, my phlox, as soon as it starts getting wet like this, if the humidity comes up, that's when your powdery mildew starts showing up. So as soon as that happens, I start spraying before I see it um, to try to get ahead of it. Because once you have it, it you can keep it from spreading, but those leaves that have that powdery mildew are, are unfortunately are powdery mildew. Yes, ma'am? I've had some black flying insects that come to you and they eat um, butterfly bush. Yeah. Um, she's got some big black. Are they beetles? The fat beetles, they're skinny like a, they, they kind of resemble almost a cockroach. But You're probably talking about blister beetles. Yeah, blister, beetles. blister beetles are one of those that you really need to pay attention to because they can decimate a yard just like that. But it only goes after the butterfly They they can you're lucky if they just do the butterfly bush because they'll they'll go after a lot of stuff. So one of the things about beetles is they can be a real challenge in the yard. And if you listen to what the entomologists tell us, there are something like 600,000 different kinds of beetles. And those are just the ones that they know about. They know there are others out there that they haven't classified and so on. So I think what maybe uh, what we might do is is break up and we can answer individual questions or show you around uh, the yard. Yeah. Oh, I missed one. Um, this is Sal, Sal Diago, goldenrod. Um, some people are allergic to this, um, but it's a really pretty plant. Um, different sizes of them. Um, this guy gets about three foot tall, um, but it, the, the yellow is just absolutely gorgeous. You can't beat that you know, pop of yellow in your yard. Full sun, also. Full sun yeah. Yeah, um, and, and you know everybody is a little bit different, um, so um, you just kind of have to know what you can have and what you can't. Um, a lot of the plants nowadays have been bred some of the pollens out of it so they're not as allergic like the junipers you know everybody's worried about the junipers um, they do have pollen but it's it's not as allergic as the alligators that are growing wild out there mm -hmm.